That's the start. All right. So something uh, that was from the, the musician, uh, William Parker, and we're going to end uh, speaking about him. Um, can't see the chat. If somebody sent me a chat, if you could say it out loud, because I can't actually access chat right now. Alex says, I love this dance party. Oh, okay, got it. Sorry, I, I didn't know if it was a technical thing. Okay, well, I'm just going to jump in here. So this is a little bit of an overview. Um, and I'm going to say, what what is at stakes here in this research? Um, I'm approaching new theoretical um, approaches aiming to overcome the duality or gap between the scholar and the practitioner, uh, and also redefining knowledge production and reintroducing arts-based research back into the academy as a co-creative inquiry based on this new scholar-practitioner posture. So the collision between philosophy or thinking and music or sound. So to start our inquiry, we will, we will begin with a provocative question raised by uh, French thinker, Francois Laurel, taking up Socrates' comments on philosophy and music. Quote, the dream kept urging me on to do what I was doing, to make music, since philosophy, in my view, is the greatest music, and that's just what I was doing. So Laurel asks, is philosophy the greatest music, as according to Socrates, or maybe is music the greatest philosophy? Here's a quote from Francois Laurel's book, Tetralogos. Quote, what is the most beautiful and greatest amongst the arts of the soul, philosophy or music, one relatively to the other? Is music the most beautiful of philosophies, philosophy being thus compromised as a norm and value for music? Or is philosophy the most beautiful of music? Thus, to intensify this question, we are given the conditions to be able to ask ourselves if music thinks, even if probably it does not think like philosophy, but perhaps with the help of philosophy, and in this case, that we take um, what, sorry, what we take as a very risky anticipation, it is music that would contribute towards thinking philosophy. Okay, so we have um, a diagram here I'll, I'll get to in a second. According to Laurel, since the time of Socrates, philosophy has granted itself the authority to think about music, therefore over-determining music through its discourse. Philosophy, and therefore musicology, has instated itself as first, quote, or superior discourse based on what he calls the principle of philosophical sufficiency. This means that through an internal auto-positioning function, called the philosophical decision, philosophy always has a meta-positionality, which gives it the hallucination that it can actually think about music and thinks on behalf of music. And that's number one in this uh, diagram, view from above. Laurel's non-standard philosophy aims to overcome the problem of thinking about the real, or music in this case, and rather asks us to think from the real, or music. This can be understood through musical experience in which music is spontaneously generated from a lived experience without the need of thetic self-reflexivity. Follow, following Laurel, we can ask, um, can music think on its own terms without the need of philosophy? If so, as a scholar practitioner, can we find a way in which music thought can co-creatively meet philosophical thought? So in this diagram, this is from uh, Burroughs and O'Sullivan. I'm going to read a quote, which uh, helps to describe it. This diagram foregrounds the particular change in vision that non-philosophy entails, a kind of dropping down of philosophical perspective. And with that, we might call a rejigging of the foreground and background relations. Here, it is as if the conceptual material has been laid out on a tabletop. This is not exactly a move from three dimensions to two, but rather a flatness in which there are no supplementary dimensions. This view from above is replaced by something more imminent, 
and this radical change in perspective enables a different treatment of philosophy. So according to this diagram, the liberated materials, which are three in the diagram, are all equalized, rendering all materials or thought forms equal. In this presentation, this will be explored as the problematic site of individual and collective individuation throughout the paper. So interesting questions that are, arise from this are um, through rejecting the philosophical decision. How do we overcome some kind of a flatland relativistic or nihilistic perspective? Um, also, how to cultivate knowledge from this perspective um, or this milieu of a problematic site through these materials and becomings? And lastly, how to build a new future with these liberated materials? I love you. See you in a few hours. Okay. Okay, here's another diagram. Um, so based on this diagram, we can see how knowledge production from this posture changes. By refusing the philosophical decision, one doesn't allow what we normally call thinking, um, according to a dogmatic image of thought, to intervene in order to think about a subject or object, but through a spontaneous action of unilateral performativity and causality, Laurel calls determination in the last instance. Um, one non-thetically performs a creative solution to a problematic field of individuation. So this site refuses the authority of any one master or meta discourse, which is uh, depicted here in two, and therefore changes perspective. We go from one directly to three. We can see that's not a dotted line. Uh, rendering all thoughts and other materials to be equally equal and unequal. Um, and this creates the space of four, which he calls fictioning. Okay, so this the conditions of thought, axiomatic versus problematic formalization. So from this theoretical understanding, we can now more formally understand how we are breaking from transcendental models based on axiomatic universals, axiomatic methods, um, which I mentioned is also called a dogmatic image of thought, to models of imminent knowledge, and that's based on the model of the problematic. Each uh, uh, approach leads to different kinds of formalization procedures and generates different kinds of knowledges. An imminent approach to the conditions of thought must be born from experience and not, and not deduced from a priori givens. Therefore, the dogmatic of Im image of thought starts with an axiom um, and proceeds to describe a problematic. For example, Platonic transcendental ideas or Kantian transcendental idealism. So Laurel inverts this order so as to start with a problematic encounter or event in which no solution is pre-given. It starts with real conditions and gives rise to abstractions through finding ideas from these unique and imminent conditions. Gil Deleuze, a contemporary thinker of Laurel, is also a thinker of imminence and deeply theorized the dogmatic image, image of thought in his uh, 1960, uh, 1968 book, Difference and Repetition. And, and is aiming to, to work and overcome the same problem and, and privilege and foreground the problematic here. Here, he is helpful to help think through the differences between axiomatic and problematic form, formalization. So in this diagram or in this slide here, we can see um, how they are, are different. So axiomatic starts with pre-given a priori. They, can, they exist independent of experience. Uh, there's closed system, it leads to major sciences, uh, like Euclidean geometry, for example. And in Deleuze's language, um, he, he thinks through extensive and intensive magnitudes. And so extensive magnitude is a qualitative, uh, a, a rational deduction and a representation. Um, cardinal numbers are one way to understand this. And this is uh, privileged by the, the rational and analytical logics of sense. And ideas are come first, the axioms here. Problematic, as we can see on the right side, is a posteriori. It's an open system. It's rooted in empirical conditions. Um, and it's uh, intensive magnitudes, um, which is felt through sensations and is a qualitative multiplicity. Ordinal numbers are a better example. First, second, for instance. Um, and this is uh, privileges sensation. And from this perspective, ideas organize problematics into axioms. So we can see how we're rejuggling the order of things here. Okay, so quickly we're going to go through the sort of the summary of this method from my perspective. So 
From the perspective of a scholar practitioner, we must first identify our problematic field of becoming, which is performative and affective. From these conditions, we intuit the idea of the problematic, and from this formulate non-sufficient hypotheses in which, uh, which organize experimental axioms, non-sufficient axioms from the non-philosophical perspective, which can generate uh, experimental uh, individual and collective individuation. Okay. So heretical in, in, in individuation. So non-philosophy here acts as a new posture of experimentation beyond epistemic and authoritative boundaries, which overdetermine potentialities and possibilities within uh, the normative and classical models of thinking and subjectivity. This new posture, Laurel calls a stranger subjectivity and opens to a new future imaginaries based on the method of fictioning. I feel this can also be called heretical individuation because it aims pr to produce novel and new um, beyond any authority, unleashing creative imagination beyond epistemic boundaries. Here's a, a fantastic quote from our chair, Debashish Banerjee. Quote, our imagination operates to start with within epistemic bounds. This means there is an unthought to our thought, which we take for granted, just as a fish may imagine different forms of, of ocean life, but not a life on land, unless it either finds its experience extended by circumstance to include land, or its imagination receives a jolt or a bolt of lightning that pushes it out of its epistemic shell into a new quantum of perception. Yet such things do happen, and the pioneers who imagine from such out-of-the-box conditions begin to give us new ideas and new epistems along, um, along with which to imagine. So this section is called axiomatic heresy. We're breaking axioms here, fabulating and or fictioning a people to come. Okay. So now that we have arrived at the ruins of philosophy and are beginning to understand how to free ourselves from the dogmatic image of thought and the philosophical decision, there remains a question of how to proceed. Are all thoughts equal? Are all materials equal? How do we avoid that relativistic and uh, flat land? Um, of course, this is not this is the opposite of what Laurel and Deleuze are trying to accomplish. And so far, I've outlined the deconstructive process in this method, and we'll now embark upon the constructive process in building ourselves outside of an authoritative or dogmatic image of thought. So where do we uh, begin our reconstructive process? What is our culture, our current cultural problematic? What axioms don't serve us like capitalism? How do we find and generate problematics? Uh, how do we find new ideas within these uh, um, problematics? How do we create concepts, find new new affects, and set new axioms that can help make new futures? I'll now turn to Deleuze to, to think more about the, the role of the arts in fictioning a new future. So, quote, the more our daily life appears standardized, automated, and that's also, me, think axiom here, stereotyped and subject to an accelerated reproduction of objects of consumption, the more art must be injected into it in order to extract from it a little difference. It's an act of resistance against and an act of struggle against the separation of the profane and sacred. This act of resistance in music ends with a cry. Here's a quote from Laurel. Art is the world without the world, the entire world, but without its overdetermining concept. Okay, so here's a slide called Mythopoesis and the People to Come. So Deleuze in his books on cinema speaks about a people to come in which art, understood as a logic of affect, is an important aspect in the invention of a shared future. So, quote, this is, this is a quote not on the page. The, this acknowledgement of a people who are missing is not a renunciation of a political cinema, but on the contrary, a new basis on which it is founded in the third world and for minorities. Art, and especially cinematographic art, must take part in this task, not that of addressing a people, which is presupposed and already there, but of con contributing to the invention of a people. And this quote on the page is um, coming from O'Sullivan and Burroughs and is about the future-orientedness um, of fabulation and fiction. 
So mythopoesis names a collective enunciation in a sense, one that is for a people, even when there is only a single reader or participant, but also from a people, even, I'll read from the screen, even when there is a parent, oh, sorry, yes, uh, it names a strange temporality. This temporality involves a particular kind of feedback loop in which future images of people and worlds are manifested within the present in order to call forth new times and relations from within this, uh, from within what is perceived or said to exist. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, just under five minutes. Okay. Let's go here. We're uh, so sono fictioning a trans uh, individual sound body. Okay, so this is this section discusses what I call sono fictioning in my practice, um, and um, okay, so so Bernard Stiegler uh, is has launched a critique of digital cap algorithmic capitalism, which shows how the culture industries have short-circuited individuation um, individually and collectively. So how can we avoid this capture? This is where I'm kind of starting in my practice. Um, how can art provide new potentials to make a different world? Um, and how can the sonic arts help generate individual and collective individuation aimed at trans-individuation? So trans-individuation is a concept by Gilbert Simondon. And here's a beautiful quote by uh, uh, Dr. Banerjee describing this metaphysical posture and how it can generate the conditions for tra uh, trans individuation. Yet what connects them to each higher assemblage is a common imagined ideal, which is the trans individual integ integrating them all. Such a trans individual cannot be named or known until integrally experienced. In our times, the collective attractor of such an, an ideal is a vanishing point that may be called a, the plane of imminence whose philosophical definition is the identity of radical plurality and absolute unity. This must be experienced uniquely in a plurality that goes all the way down and trans-individuates towards the open whole of the plane of imminence, which lies always already and unique, uniquely in each element, working together in a polis of the future that supports an ethos and interpretation forming unique individual and collective becomings towards the embodiment of such a trans individual is the imagination of the unthought within the thought of our times. And so for me, the practice of sonal fictioning is directly tied to this question of, of the people to come of the, the trans individual. And so I've, uh, I'm, I've, drawn a diagram here I'd like to share with you. Um, so Deleuze demands us that we think, or demands that we think ethics, politics, and aesthetics simultaneously from a plane of imminence, um, as we just heard about, is a condition for trans-individuation. And so this diagram is part of my practice. Um, and we can see this diagram for me in my practice is helps me build minor genealogies um, can discovering uh, becoming minor through music. It places multiple centers in resonance circuits to create long circuit transgenerational circuits of trans individuation. And it aims to transgress the short circuits of the culture industries. And so um, this, this you, we can see here, there's a line, the line of individuation, sub, subjectification, subjectivation. It's, and it's kind of, I'm, I'm looking at this becoming this line is the the line of flight or the becoming and this is this is a, a place where these these cat these are not categories or rational categories they're they're more they're more affective categories in which we are kind of transducing or putting them into experimental relationships and so i find it really important to consider consider these three the aesthetic political and ethical as i'm um as I'm doing sonal fictioning as a practice. It also takes into consideration in the first uh, uh, triangle here, the I, the we, and the they. The they here is the represents the culture industries, the, the forces that are not serving us in the world. And I'm going to play quickly a, uh, a piece from William Parker's. When I was in school, I noticed. Uh, that there was great wisdom and knowledge in the sky. Shortly after that, the sky translated itself into music, the tone world. It swallowed me up 
the way a whale would swallow up a guppy dipped in mama's homemade tomato sauce. It is through sound that I learned how to live, to live. I have become one with the mystery, and it is an overwhelming project. The closer you get, the further you are away from it. The closer you get, the further you are away from it. Then one day my father came home with a saxophone in a brown wooden case. I got you a soprano sax. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life, in my life. The next week I was sent to the Cosmic Music School where I was trained in all aspects of healing through sound, trance systems, tone systems, heartbeat codes, blues and melodic systems, harmonic systems, compassion systems, myth and dream systems, ritual systems, mystery music systems, celestial music systems, spiritual music systems, ceremonial music systems. It was a revelation, this study. Learning that life Okay, and I think uh, William Parker demonstrates so beautifully this 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 practice, and I think we can understand and learn through his life and his work. Um, one of many artists in my life, but somebody who's practicing sono fictioning involving this these three aesthetic, ethical, and political and and um, and he's a huge inspiration for me. I just wanted to share that to end. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening.